Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is David Ellis and I have the privilege of serving as the interim uh, executive director for the Harvard Museum of Natural History, which means I have a chance to introduce some wonderful people, hear some wonderful talks, among a lot of other things. We thank you for coming tonight uh, to hear a talk about the rise and fall of the City of Elms by Thomas Campanella. Now, two quick housekeeping notes. Please power off your cell phones. Not just put them on vibrate or something of that sort, but please power them off. It means that we'll have a better chance of having this system work, uh, the microphone work, if you will do that. Uh, I doubt if we're going to have a lot of air conditioning tonight, but if they come on, you may want to move up a couple rows. It can be a little noisy in the back. Tonight is our fourth annual New Directions in Echo Planning Lecture. This lecture was established in 2009 with a generous gift from Michael Diet, AB68, MRP of 72, and Heidi Richardson. The goal of this series is to spotlight an individual who is making significant contributions to the integration of ecology within the fields of land use and urban planning, architecture, and other related sectors. And tonight we're delighted to present someone who is an accomplished scholar as well as a professional urban planner. He's an urbanist and an historian focused on the history and design of various American landscapes and also urban areas both here and abroad. Currently associate professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, he's from New York, earning his bachelor's at SUNY and his master's in landscape architecture at Cornell. And then he had the good fortune to come to Cambridge, <laughs> where he earned his PhD in urban planning at MIT and was just recently a visiting lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He's written several influential books on urbanism. Tonight he'll be mostly addressing the idea behind his 2003 book, Republic of Shade, New England and the American Elm. His most recent book is The Concrete Dragon, China's Revolution and What It Means for the World, a primer on China's new urbanism. He's been working on urban planning issues in China for 20 years. He's also consulted on urban design projects in South Korea, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Japan. And when he's not jetting off to Asia, he's been quite active in his own state where he served for two years as planning commissioner of Hillsborough County. I believe that would be a more applied role. Uh, prior to academia, this is what I was very interested in, here's a man who's been a firefighter, an EMT, a fire lookout operator for the uh, United States Forest Service, and a licensed pilot. So, great fun, wonderful that you're on spring break in North Carolina, and thank you for joining us. <laughs> Tom Campanella. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's nice to be back in, in, in my old neighborhood here, literally. I used to live just down Oxford Street for a while. My, my talk today, and I apologize for this green, green cloud here. Uh, uh, it's the, there's something wrong with that projector. We have these other two, which should be more color correct. Um, my talk today is, is about the metamorphosis of a, a tree uh, from a, a wayside weed, uh, so to speak, into a regional icon. And it's also about the uh, rise and fall of that uh, most beloved, most mourned, and most uniquely American of vernacular landscapes, Elm Street. Elm Street was a Yankee innovation that uh, spread fast and eventually became a national institution. And even today, it still uh, has resonance, uh, despite uh, the virtual uh, expert extirpation of the uh, namesake, namesake tree. By the 1930s, uh, it was estimated that more than a billion 
uh, elm trees, American elms, uh, shaded the uh, cities and towns and suburbs and parks of the United States. A great green cloud, to paraphr paraphrase Berton Rocher, uh, and the most extensive urban forest ever planted. Of the many native tree species encountered by European botanical explorers, Almus Americana, the American elm, was singled out uh, early on for its beauty uh, and its elegant form. Luigi Castiglioni, a Milanese patrician who toured North America in 1780, looking for trees of potential commercial uh, use and value back home in Italy, wrote this of the elm, and I quote, it is remarkable for the beauty of its branches, which are numerous, very widespreading, and pendant, almost like those of the African willow." Unquote. Castiglione is among uh, uh, the first to point out uh, that the tree, um, that these formal properties uh, would make the tree ideal for urban use, for use as a street tree. Uh, and he goes on to say that it would be and I quote, preferable to the European, European elm for making avenues and for other ornamental plantings. <clears throat> this is a painting of the Connecticut River Valley by um, Albert Bierstadt, rather exaggerated uh, anyway, <laughs> at least topographically, but I, I, the, the image of the elms there is what I put it up for. Now, in New England, uh, it's clear from the historical record that the elm uh, was long a dominant presence in the colonial landscape, and it's important to understand how uh, this came about. When the Europeans arrived in the New World, what they found was not this unspoiled, howling wilderness, so often romantically uh, reported back, back home, but rather an inhabited landscape, shaped and crafted for centuries uh, by human beings. Native peoples along the Atlantic seaboard were active uh, and uh, uh, active land managers uh, and were particularly adept at uh, using fire uh, to shape the landscape, mainly to, to encourage a browse for game animals uh, to prepare land for planting. Now the key here is that firing the landscape did not uh, affect all of its parts equally. The drier uplands burned readily. The wet lowlands often did not burn at all. Uh, and so in turn, bottomland and riparian tree species were effectively favored by firing while others were repeatedly burned, beaten back, burned back. And so one of these uh, tr species favored was uh, Almus Americana. And this is uh, why when European colonists uh, began clearing these bottomlands, they encountered old growth elms of immense size and height. Now clearing this land was obviously very labor intensive, but it was a job worth doing, not only because these lowlands um, made for uh, very productive farmland, but because the felled trees were themselves, uh, themselves a source of, of income uh, uh, or could be used for building material. But not all the bottomland tree species were worth felling. Some were much more valuable than others. In the colonial New England timber economy, Elmwood had relatively low commercial value. Uh, if any of you have worked elm wood, you know this. It's a tough and fibrous wood. It takes forever to dry. Uh, it warps a, a lot and so on. So the American elm and elm wood was essentially, it was essentially a trash tree. And as a result, these trees, which were also enormous, right, so it would take a lot of labor to bring it down for no real purpose, they were often left behind while the more valuable tree species were taken down. So, so spared from indigenous fire, uh, spared again because of the, they were just not worth felling, uh, these old growth elms began to uh, gain a powerful presence in the landscape, simply by a process of elimination. Now, in time, 
some of these trees assumed important cultural associations, uh, becoming uh, secular totems of a sort in the uh, Yankee landscape. And there's, there's a, a wonderful parody or symmetry between the, uh, the, um, the, the, these totemic elm trees and the whitewashed uh, uh, meeting house or church steeple uh, on the green. One of the best examples of a, a totem elm in New England was the Pittsfield elm, which you see in this drawing here. <clears throat> the Pittsfield elm was already more than 200 years old when the area was first settled by Europeans. To uh, Nathaniel Haw Hawthorne, it, it possessed, and I quote, the loftiest and straightest stem that I ever beheld. It was this tree, by the way, that, um, that, um, that um, Herman Melville makes reference to uh, uh, when describing the scar on Ahab's face. He, just, he compares it to a lightning streak or a scar down the trunk of the, of the Pittsfield. Um, he, he lived in Pittsfield for a while. Uh, and in time, uh, this tree uh, becomes both a symbol of Pittsfield uh, as well as a kind of maypole um, about which uh, much of the uh, community life uh, orbited. Here's, a, here's a, a piece of ceramic, and there's this, the parody or the symmetry between uh, those uh, icons. <clears throat> and uh, right here at Harvard, there was a, a, an analogous tree uh, that lasted well into the 19th century. This was the, the Harvard class elm uh, uh, here. Um, I think that's Holden. Is that right? Holden Chapel, I think, right there. That tree is long gone as is the Pittsfield tree. Closer to us, uh, well, over, over on the other side of the, uh, the Charles River was the Liberty tree, uh, which grew in, uh, it, really in, in what is today part of Chinatown. Uh, and uh, this became a very potent political symbol and a touchstone of the uh, revolutionary uh, movement uh, here in Boston. The tree grew adjacent to a tavern that was a popular meeting place for the Sons of Liberty. Uh, that may or may not be what it looked like there. Um, in any case, the tree gained uh, uh, fame or infamy, depending with your, on your perspective, uh, uh, with the passage of the uh, much hated Stamp Act in 1765. Effigies are, are hanged from its limbs and so forth. And from this elm, uh, liberty tree fever uh, speeds through the 13 colonies, appearing as far uh, away as New York and Savannah, Georgia, and uh, involving, by the way, not necessarily always elms and not even always trees. Uh, a pole would do if you were lacking. Uh, in Lower Manhattan, it was a liberty pole. Uh, and that, that tradition, actually, from this tree, uh, speeds uh, further around the world, makes its way across the Atlantic. Uh, there are liberty poles and liberty trees uh, in France that are among the symbols uh, later on of the French Revolution. Now, other, other uh, Yankee totem elms were, um, were honored simply for their great age and antiquity. Remember that in the early years of the Republic, Americans felt keenly this lack of the the sort of fabled ruins that endowed the European landscape with such beauty and historical depth. Uh, but uh, as quote unquote nature's nation, uh, we, we did have uh, aged trees uh, that at least uh, looked as timeless and as hoary as the rubble on the, along the Appian Way. Uh, and uh, the Victorian tastemaker and uh, landscape architect, Andrew Jackson Downing, uh, described it in this way, and I'm quoting here. If we have neither old castles nor old associations, we have at least here and there old trees that can teach us lessons of antiquity not less instructive and poetical than the ruins of a past age. And one of the best examples of this uh, tradition was the great elm, so-called, of Boston. The tree was venerated throughout the 19th century, not only as a community totem. Uh, this is it, by the way, uh, that little, little guy right there. <clears throat> this is before all the filling that created the uh, back bay, of course. There, this is another view from the uh, 17th, uh, 18th century here. 
Uh, and, and here you see uh, some images of it. So not only does it become this community uh, totem uh, here, um, uh, but um, a, a, uh, really a living link uh, between the present and this mythified uh, aboriginal past. Right? Uh, one Boston antiquarian described, described this tree as, and I quote, a witness upon the field of history. Right? Uh, and here you see, there's a drawing of it there. There were songs written to it. Uh, here you see a meeting of evidently uh, all or most of the Methodist ministers in New England under the, uh, the great elm. There was near, nearly a riot uh, when this tree uh, finally fell in the 1870s with scores of Bostonians uh, fighting each other for a piece of its limbs. The uh, fallen tree uh, was also revealed uh, to be not nearly as old as uh, its legend <laughs> suggested. T tree rings um, uh, tend not to tell lies, as we'll see uh, again here uh, in Cambridge uh, in a moment. Elms also served as, as witness trees in the New England landscape. Arboreal vessels bearing the memory of significant deeds or persons. Again, if the old world remembered with limestone and marble, nature's nation would use instead trees. And I, I'm referring here to uh, both elms specifically planted to mark an event uh, or memory, um, as well as, and, and even more so, uh, the, the extraordinary uh, gravitational attraction or gravitational pull that a wayside or volunteer elm uh, could exert as it grew large and beautiful and gained that appropriate appearance of, 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 an, of great age. Uh, the tree would effectively draw memory to itself, um, becoming the, the nesting site, so to speak, of uh, historical events in the vicinity. The, the great uh, naturalist and writer Donald Culrose Peaty understood this very well, this nexus between elm and memory. Uh, he wrote, and I quote, if you want to be recalled for something that you do, you would be well advised to do it under an elm. <laughs> and the New England landscape of the 18th and 19th centuries was full of such monument elms. Many were associated uh, with revol Revolutionary War events and figures or the founders. Uh, this is the Franklin Elm in, uh, in, in New Haven, Connecticut, new, right off the green. Lafayette Elm, uh, this was one in, I, uh, in uh, Cohasset, I think. Uh, I forget exactly where this is. Um, <clears throat> no man claimed more elms than the father of the country, George Washington. There uh, were at least six elms in New England associated with him, probably many more, I know for sure six. Uh, none uh, was more famous than the fabled Washington elm right here in Cambridge. Uh, this tree originally stood on Cambridge uh, Common, though it was later marooned uh, in a traffic island, as you see on the left there. Uh, in what now is the intersection of Garden and Mason Streets. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. There is actually a marker uh, in the pavement there uh, where, that, where you see that tree uh, that, um, that is, is actually a marker uh, to, noting that the Washington Elm stood there. Uh, from more than a few feet away, it actually it looks very much like a manhole cover. <laughs> Has anyone actually seen that in the, in the intersection? Yeah, a couple of, a few folks. It's, it's, it's a very hazardous thing to go look at. Uh, it literally is in the middle of the, a very busy intersection. The Washington Elm was the most famous tree in America uh, for near, nearly a century. Uh, and its story, uh, part myth and part truth, is a, a, a fascinating uh, study in uh, what we might refer to and, and uh, what the historian Eric Hobsbawm has called an invented tradition. Uh, that tradition uh, would have been well known to any uh, schoolboy or girl uh, uh, in America up till about 1920 or so. 
Uh, and it was that Washington took command of the colonial regiments beneath the spreading uh, limbs of this elm uh, at, the, at the beginning of the American Revolution. A as is recorded in this, tab this tablet here, which, which is on, on just, just to the right of that, uh, on the common. I'm sure you, you, many of you are familiar with this here. The, the story was, was uh, later proven to have been uh, mostly fabricated over the years by a number of writers, uh, one of whom being Washington Irving. Uh, Washington did, in fact, George Washington did, in fact, uh, take uh, command of the Continental uh, troops on Cambridge Common, uh, but not under uh, this tree, rather in a building, um, a building just down the street from here, that uh, was later tor torn down by the law school. It, it was about where Austin Hall, the Richardson building, uh, sits uh, now. So once the building was destroyed, um, it, it's almost as if this legend was homeless for a while and it sort of drifted about aimlessly and then attached itself to this uh, uh, by then appropriately uh, large and, and, uh, and uh, beautiful uh, spreading elm tree. The trees uh, fall in, in 1921 um, uh, uh, re revealed the truth. Uh, it was also, by the way, um, blamed on, um, uh, at one point it was blamed on uh, subversive agents and communist agents, uh, the falling of the tree. Um, the, growth, the growth rings uh, revealed the truth, uh, which was uh, that if indeed Washington stood under this elm in, in April 1775, he would have been doubled over to fit beneath a very small sapling. Um, now, up to, to up to this point, I've been talking about the American elm as uh, an, as a solitary uh, object in the um, in the landscape. But by the 1840s or so, New Englanders also began uh, to planting elms in large numbers as a means of beautifying their towns and villages, uh, motivated really by a dawning sensibility toward nature and environment in this period, in the 1830s and 40s. It's something that I've referred to, I, or I referred to in the book as the environmental awakening. Um, this is um, partly a function of European romanticism, uh, and it manifests uh, in a variety of ways here in the United States. The transcendentalist movement uh, based in Concord, that's Henry David there on the left, um, the Hudson River School of Landscape Painting, the Rural Cemetery Movement, which also culminates here in Cambridge with Mount Auburn, with Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, uh, and so forth and so forth, so on. The, the awakening also stokes um, fresh interest in uh, environmental design. Uh, and what uh, John Stilgo, one of my, one of my teachers here, uh, has called, and I quote, a new craving for spatial beauty. Uh, this is the era of the pattern books, uh, of A.J. Andrew Jackson Downing's popular works, an illustration of which you see in the lower left there, uh, on the correct uh, appointment of one's uh, home grounds and so forth. But it also triggers this extraordinary grassroots movement here in New England uh, that results in the establishment of village improvement societies throughout the region. And from the start, the primary, the primary occupation uh, of these, um, of these uh, societies is planting elm trees uh, along the, the streets and on the village greens and commons in these towns. Now, the, and here's, a, here's a, a drawing from that period. Now, the obvious question then is why, why elm trees? We've certainly seen that this tree had, a, had real cultural resonance already in New England. But up till now, Americans, even here in New England, uh, had actually favored other species when it came to urban use for street trees. And these were often uh, non-native uh, tree species. What explains the rise of the elm here is partly its great formal beauty. It's partly the very fast rate of growth 
of the tree. This is a tree that, you know, you don't have to wait most of your life to appreciate some scale uh, with. But it's also due to uh, Jacksonian era uh, nationalism, which places new emphasis and new value on all things American, including American trees. Prior to this, Americans had something of a cultural inferiority complex and looked to England and Europe uh, as the touchstone of all things good and tasteful. What trees had been planted in the U.S., in, in, in U.S. cities, uh, were almost all exotics from the old world. Lombardy poplar, for example, a tree associated with the storied lands of Roman antiquity, was planted by the thousands in Boston, in Philadelphia, New York, uh, Washington in this period, in the very late, late 18th, early 19th. And uh, this is a view of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue looking toward the Capitol lined on both sides by Lombardy <laughs> poplars. The Chinese Alanthus was, was, was also a popular tree, more in, in, uh, in New York, although I think I have a, uh, a, a Washington too. These are Alanthus trees um, uh, later on. Uh, New York City, um, Washington Square was actually uh, planted exclusively with Atlantis at one point. And here you see them again on Pennsylvania Avenue. But now what comes uh, is a, an extraordinary backlash against these uh, quote unquote foreign invaders and a strident, uh, even, uh, even racist call uh, to plant instead only Native American trees. Oliver Wendell Holmes compared aging Lombardy poplars to, and I quote, dead pharaohs stiffened in their cerements. <laughs> On Boston Common, Mayor Josiah Quincy Sr. personally felled the poplars on uh, the Park Street Mall uh, and had them uh, replaced with elms. But at least the Lombardy poplar claimed European heritage. The Alanthus brought out the very worst of Jacksonian era bigotry. And A.J. Downing uh, himself led the charge. There's, there he is. The Alanthus he charged has, and I'm quoting here from Downing, the fair outside and the treacherous heart of the Asiatics. <laughs> it was but a, and I'm quoting again here, a, a usurper which has come over this fair land of, uh, I'm sorry, over this land of liberty to make foul the air with its pestilential breath and devour the soil with its intermeddling roots. We confess openly that our crowning objection to this petted Chinaman is a patriotic objection. It is that he has drawn away our attention from our more noble Native American trees to waste it on this miserable pigtail of an Indiaman." Unquote. <laughs> well, the very first Village Improvement Society uh, was here in Massachusetts. It was founded in Sheffield, Massachusetts in 1853. <clears throat> and it was actually called, it was named the Elm Tree Association. Sheffield was already uh, well known for its great uh, totem elm. This, this is a, a postcard of it here. Um, but it was also the site of an extraordinary event in 1846, some years before the founding of the Improvement Society even, um, and this was the great Sheffield Tree Bee. This was a community, a community tree planting event, uh, unprecedented as far as I've been able to tell in, uh, in New England, uh, and it went on for two weeks, resulted in the planting of some 1,000 sapling elms on the streets of the town. And so what had long been a solitary element in the landscape becomes now uh, an element of urban design, a creator of space, a shaper of urban space. And if you had to put your finger on the birthplace of Elm Street in America, it's really this. It's really Sheffield 
uh, and the Treby in 1846. The village improvement movement sweeps across New England. In Massachusetts and Connecticut alone, there are some 75 improvement societies by 1880 or so. Uh, and by planting hundreds of thousands of elm trees, these groups literally changed the face of New England. Certainly, as I said, it's this yearning, this craving for spatial beauty that's driving uh, people here. Um, but there's also economics at work. Oh, and, and here's a view of Sheffield um, uh, later on. New England was deeply mired in economic recession when the village improvement movement came about. And it's no coincidence. What, what happened, uh, what triggered the economic, uh, the agricultural, the decline of the agricultural economy was the completion and the opening of the uh, Erie Canal uh, in New York, which um, uh, effectively put the vast and very productive uh, hinterland of upstate New York and the, and the, and the near Midwest uh, in uh, close uh, reach of the port of New York City. So farmers in New England who never had it, you know, farming has never been an easy thing in New England to begin with. Uh, they are now effectively cut out of the loop here. Uh, and, uh, and there's a, a very significant, very steep decline uh, that the New England rural economy goes through in this uh, period. Many New Englanders now head out west themselves. Uh, others uh, move to cities. Uh, to find work in factories. Uh, the inf I'm sure you all know this, but the, in the entire workforce um, uh, of the, the mills in Lowell and Lawrence in the early years uh, was effectively made up uh, of Yankee farm girls who are desperate to help their families out uh, economically. The decline of these once prosperous rural towns really baffles the elite. As one minister wrote in his journal in 1857, and I quote, what is it that is coming over our New England villages that looks like deterioration and running down? Is our life going out of us to enrich the great West? And indeed, it was. It also leads to a scramble for new sources of revenue and economic sustenance. It's around uh, this time that regional tourism in New England begins to take off as affluent, aging, middle-class New Yorkers and Bostonians, many, who, many of whom uh, were in fact born and raised in rural New England, rediscover the region's charms. This is when rural New England uh, becomes a, a, a popular tourist destination. City people buy summer homes and hobby farms all over the region infusing these rural economies uh, with uh, cash and new life. So what happens here is these towns um, begin competing uh, with each other for the summer people. Um, those that planted elms early are by now truly beautiful places. Uh, those that had procrastinated now begin planting elms with a fury, uh, desperate to conform. Uh, in a sense, to this, this image that was congealing at this time, this image of the ideal New England town. It's an image that uh, is, is, is uh, popularized in various media and, and uh, curry or knives images and so forth. So if your town was to survive, um, it needed, at minimum, a, a town common uh, anchored by, of course, the meeting house with its steeple, but also uh, it had to be well planted with elms. Um, and um, there's a wonderful book by Dona Brown that, that tracks this whole uh, story. Um, one town went uh, as far as to plow under an old, um, an old cemetery uh, to create this tree-tossed uh, common that, uh, that it never had. <laughs> but in the end, even sh streets banked with elms uh, could not um, save many a town from economic decline. Um, um, though the trees did serve very well to mask uh, many of the traces and evidence of poverty and abandonment. This is something that Henry James uh, very keenly observes in the American scene, uh, the book that he wrote upon returning 
uh, to the United States after a 20-year hiatus uh, in Europe. Um, and he describes village elms in New England as a seductive veil, uh, which was often um, we, behind which um, there was often only emptiness and decay. And I, I'm quoting here uh, from uh, from James, having spoken having spoken of them as elm shaded. This is what he wrote of these towns. Uh, you have said so much about them that little else remains. <laughs> Well, not all, not all writers were so sour. By the end of the 19th century, <clears throat> by the end of the 19th century, um, the Elm and Elm Street are really among the most celebrated uh, features of the uh, Yankee landscape. Uh, the tree becomes a, a true regional icon uh, and looms large in uh, countless literary and graphic representations of the region. Um, there are literally scores of breathless descriptions of New England's, uh, New England's elms, uh, but I'll, I'll read you uh, just one of my favorites here. This is um, from the, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, abolitionist uh, Brooklyn uh, preacher, uh, Henry Ward Beecher, himself a Yankee, grew up in Connecticut. He, he wrote, the elms of New England, they are as much a part of her beauty as the columns of the Parthenon were the glory of its architecture. New, uh, Elm Street was a spatial and aesthetic delight uh, and even gained uh, an element of religious association. Numerous accounts um, describe trees, I mean, I'm sorry, streets transformed into rough hewn uh, or unhewn cathedrals uh, by the Gothic arch, as you can see in this image here, of these upthrust limbs. But more than this, Elm Street was the most successful attempt on the part of 19th century Americans to fuse town and country, to create um, a city in apparent harmony with the natural world. This is a very American uh, quest, this quest for, for a, a pastoral urbanism, as James Maitre has called it, uh, for a synthesis between city and countryside, machine and the garden, to paraphrase Leo Marx. Uh, um, uh, it, it really becomes a, a, a leitmotif of American uh, landscape and urban um, and uh, history of urbanism in this period. So seen through this lens, Elm Street is, is much more than just a, a street full of elms. It is a space of reconciliation and redemption. Um, it is the city tempered uh, with uh, keepsakes of, of rural nature. And really the apotheosis of this, uh, of this, this uh, um, omic urbanism, uh, if, that's, if that's a proper phrase, uh, in 19th century America was this, right? This is New Haven. This is Temple Street uh, across the green uh, in New Haven, uh, circa 1860 or so. Uh, New Haven was famous around the world in this period as the Elm City, the city of elms. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Nathaniel Parker Willis, a very popular writer in the mid-19th century, described the city as a, and I'm quoting here, or a town roofed in with leaves. The whole scene, though in the midst of a city, breathes of nature. Charles Dickens made it a stop on his celebrated American tour of, uh, in, in, in 1842, and he immediately got the point. At New Haven, he wrote, and I quote, the rows of grand old elm trees bring about a kind of compromise between town and country, as if each had met the other halfway and shaken hands upon it. This is an etching of that same street. Now, by the end of the 19th century, <clears throat> New England's um, urban elm forest had, had really reached its apogee. Uh, the trees would endure for several decades more, but they were already under siege. Prior to the Civil War, most town and, and village uh, streets were unpaved. 
And what this, by the way, is Mass, Mass Avenue, um, just over the Arlington line, the Cambridge Arlington line. I'm sure you all know this spot. Um, I think there's a hotel on the left now there. Anyway, this is 1890s or so. Um, so most streets in, in towns and, and villages and even in many cities were unpaved uh, in the 19th century. What pavement was used um, was, was, was usually very porous, uh, cobblestone, uh, Belgian block brick and so forth. Tree roots were uh, largely undisturbed, uh, had easy access to water and oxygen, and really the only threats uh, were the nibblings of horses, which actually could be quite destructive, uh, and the occasional collision with a, a carriage or a cart. By the 1880s or so, streetscape modernization begins to make the life of um, a street tree perilous indeed. Streets are paved uh, with increasingly impervious materials depriving the trees of water, oxygen. Root systems are destroyed by repeated excavations for all sorts of new infrastructure. Sewer lines, water mains, electrical cables, uh, leaking uh, gas poisons the trees. Overhead, lim limbs are, are hacked mercilessly, as you can see on that magnificent tree there on the left, um, <clears throat> to uh, accommodate power lines and streetcar catenary. Uh, in some places, uh, the trees themselves actually serve as the utility poles uh, at, at first and, and, and are routinely uh, killed by, um, by electrical current. They're effectively electrocuted. And so now, what happens is that weakened uh, by all these new environmental stresses, uh, the elms start falling victim to diseases and, and insect pests uh, that uh, in the past hardly bothered them at all. And then comes a terrible new disease. I don't expect you can read that. I, I mainly wanted to show you this guy here. This is um, Dutch elm disease. Uh, it's named uh, not, not for its place of origin, which is actually Asia, but for the team of women uh, scientists in Holland who first identify it. It's a, it's a fungal infection. The main vector is that guy there, this is the elm bark beetle. Uh, it also uh, can spread very effectively through a root contact between trees that are uh, planted too close together. So the fungus, the way it works is it basically clogs up the tree's vascular system and li literally strangles the tree to death. If you've ever seen an elm that's getting Dutch elm disease, the first sign is flagging in the outer, outer limbs. Dutch elm disease had already ravaged the elms uh, of Europe. Uh, where scientists at first actually thought it, it was the uh, result of nerve gas used during uh, World War I. It, it crosses the Atlantic, it comes to uh, the United States on shipments of elm burl logs. Uh, in, in the 1930s, elm burl was very popular for veneer, for use on, on furniture. This is how it comes in. By 1933, in, infected trees were found in the vicinity of New York, the port, and, and, the, and New York City, uh, as well as southernmost parts of Connecticut. And within a few years, a, a hot zone uh, was spreading rapidly north and east, uh, helped along by winds that carried this tiny insect. This guy is actually very, very small. Um, uh, uh, these, these, uh, the prevailing winds were, were effectively carrying and forcing, pushing the uh, elm bark beetle up into uh, New England. This graphic here was, um, was used to illustrate a study uh, done in the 1930s to determine uh, whether or not prevailing winds were, uh, were pushing the disease into New England. They released all these balloons with little tags and you'd, you would mail back uh, where, when they were found, you'd, you know, the person would mail it back and they would plot out with the, uh, postal, uh, the postal stamps to figure out um, the array of the wind here. By the summer of 1938, Dutch elm disease is literally on the doorstep of New England, the city of elms. 
the accelerant that propels Dutch elm disease um, uh, across and into the heart of New England now uh, is the great hurricane of 1938. This is the most powerful hurricane ever to strike uh, New England, that we know of at least. Uh, the storm comes up the Atlantic coast, crashes into uh, across Long Island and into Connecticut uh, on September 21st, and it makes landfall very close to New Haven, moves rapidly right up the Connecticut River uh, Valley. This is the, the very cradle and heartland of elm culture in America. And the hurricane really wrecked uh, havoc on New England's trees. The wind was bad enough, this is in Amherst, um, gusting to 180 miles an hour in some places. Um, but it had also rained for four or five days prior to the storm. The soils were saturated. Um, the grip of the tree roots was, was uh, much diminished. Uh, and of course, the trees are all in full leaf as well. Right? And so there are great big sails, in effect, uh, catching the full force of the wind. Century-old trees are just tossed about like you see here, like matchsticks. Um, many towns lost almost all their elms. Um, and, and it's my theory um, um, that, uh, that it was the, um, <clears throat> the great hurricane that turbocharged the spread of Dutch elm disease right across uh, and up into and across New England. Storm-wrecked uh, elms were cut up and stored in landfills and lots uh, after the storm, providing the bark beetle with um, an abundance of, of breeding grounds. Uh, and it's very likely uh, that looking at the spread of the, the disease in the years after 38, that beetle populations exploded, basically, right? Um, providing this army of invaders uh, that within, within a few years had, had carried uh, Dutch elm disease right across uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts and beyond. Now, efforts to, to save the elms were actually very effective at first, focused on sanitation, uh, and Connecticut really led in this regard. Uh, this, they put the um, Civilian Conservation Corps crews to very good use uh, to carry out a, an aggressive sanitation campaign. Scores of, of uh, the CCC crews would go out, patrol towns, flag, identify uh, uh, infected trees for removal. The trees were cut down, they were burned, so forth. But fate was just not on the side of the elm. Uh, with America's entry into World War II, almost all the manpower, resources, money that was being used to combat Dutch elm disease is, of course, channeled instead toward the war effort. Um, and so with sanitation efforts on hold, um, Dutch elm disease really just spreads uh, wildly through the region. By the time the GIs come back, uh, it's too late. Um, uh, DDT uh, offers some hope at first, uh, but obviously its dangers are very uh, soon after revealed uh, by Rachel Carson and others, um, and there's really little uh, left to do uh, except clean up the mess. And so all through the 1950s uh, and uh, 60s, um, you have uh, seen, and into, even into the 1970s, you have scenes uh, like uh, these um, here. New England's uh, vast uh, urban elm forest is is, is taken down, felled tree by tree, sometimes entire streets at a time. Uh, and among the casualties were uh, all of the last remaining great witness trees. This is the, this is the, the Weathersfield elm uh, here, which uh, looked like this uh, not very uh, long before. This was supposed to be the largest elm uh, in New England. And it gives you a sense of the cultural uh, gravity of this, of this tree in New England when you have an entire uh, you know, a school of, of youngsters let out of class to essentially uh, bid farewell to the stump of this tree. All right, this is 19, 1953. Um, I'm not sure, but it, it was well over 200 years, I'm sure. I'm sorry? Um, by the by, Dutch elm disease or by the, no no it's it's really the, as far as I know it's only the the elms that are affected and pr primarily uh, almost Amer the American elm. Uh, 
But it was on ordinary streets like this that the loss of the elm was most acutely felt, right? The, the disappearance of a great totem elm like the Weathersfield was painful enough, but this is where it really struck a home. Uh, and the passing of the elm changed forever um, the, uh, the face of New England. Uh, and in time, by the 70s and 80s, uh, much of urban and small town America across the upper Midwest and beyond. And it really marks the end of both an era as well as a, a, a national landscape. And um, this, uh, this is, I mean, I can't imagine a more profound spatial transformation than this, right? This is a street in Waukegan, Illinois, uh, to this, right? That's the same street, right? It, it's, a, it's a different world. It's a completely different uh, world. Now, of course, we know well uh, today uh, that, um, that, uh, that uh, Elm Street was a tragedy uh, waiting to happen. What seemed so utterly natural, forest giants planted on city streets, uh, was in fact a very high, highly artificial state of affairs. Um, the elm is a solitary tree. Uh, it never grows in pure stands. Uh, what we created was a, an unsustainable monoculture, right? a condition that brought about uh, the very forces that destroyed it. Um, it was the high planting density um, of Elm Street that allowed the main vector, <clears throat> the, Dutch, uh, the, the, elm, the main vector of Dutch elm disease, the elm bark beetle, uh, to spread like wildfire, not to mention root co uh, contact spread between the, root, um, the roots. I, I want to close with a, a, with a passage from the end of my book and I'm quoting here, quoting myself now. However well-intentioned, the Yankee elm planters of the past committed a grave error in planting their cherished elms as far as the eye could see. But what a glorious error it was, and what magic, what magnificence their recklessness bestowed. Thank you. <laughs>